The Benjamin Dixon Show is only possible with listener support. Go to www.thebenjamindixonshow.com to register for our blog and join the progressive army. And now, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, and now about to witness the truth. It's the Benjamin Dixon Show. Welcome. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Benjamin Dixon Show. I am your host, Benjamin Dixon. It is Thursday, March 16th, 2017. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, exciting show. Well, I don't know how exciting it is, but we got stuff to talk about, as always. And as always, you can join the conversation, 857-600-0518. Um, phone lines are open as soon as you guys start calling. We'll start talking to you. Uh, thanks to all of our patrons, all of our supporters, without whom this is not possible. Um, for our patrons, we have a bonus show that is up, uh, that will be up. Uh, I guess we'll put it up right after the show. We, we really thought about putting our bonus content up the next morning. I'll decide by the end of the show. But anyway, we had a chance to have a great conversation about um, cultural relativism in, and Star Trek. Um, so it's, it's a fascinating conversation about, um, what right do we have, if any, or do we have the right? And should we impose our values as a culture on, on another civilization that has their own culture? Uh, so if you want to join that conversation, it's a good, uh, it's a really good conversation. If I must say so myself, you can go to patreon.com forward slash the BPD show and, um, become a patron and support the show. All right. That being said, um, let's talk about Donald Trump. Uh, Donald Trump's budget, uh, he has leaked out uh, key components of his budget. And, you know, this is where I stand with budgets. Budgets are um, more often than not, budgets are a reflection of your values, particularly a president or the Speaker of the House or a senator or whoever's pushing a particular budget. It communicates your values. It communicates what's important to you. And from that, we can extrapolate it that it represents your character um, and what's important to you enough to put money behind it. Donald Trump's budget has come out and we see um, that the way he's going to pay for all of his uh, for his wall, the way he's going to pay for his um, his increase in military spending, it's going to be on the backs of of the most marginalized in society uh and on the back of of the arts and the sciences it's 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 um uh it's it's insane to be quite honest with you um the the depth of disdain that is communicated in this budget so let's get to some particular numbers and you'll see exactly what i'm talking about so the first thing he does is he boosts uh military spending by 54 billion dollars now we saw this coming down the pipe um he mentioned this previously but this is offset by cuts um of the same size to non-defense programs um, early drafts described by the government officials call for d dramatic cuts, including agencies, including um, one quarter of the Environmental Protection Agency's budget, a third of the State Department's spending uh, across the board cuts on other agencies. Uh, he's gutting mills on wheels. Mills on damn wheels. This is a target to be cut so that he can increase his spending on the military. Um, the Trump administration released a blueprint budget that would eliminate funding for the Community Development Block Grant, the CDBG program, which provides partial funding for local mills on wheels. So what are we going to spend money on? The military. Who's going to pay for it? The poor and the needy and the indigent. But it gets worse. Um, uh, so in addition to the, uh, the local mill on wheels, the National Mill on Wheels office receives the bulk of its funding from sources other than uh, the block grant. Uh, but the effect of the cuts on local mills on wheels is still not exactly clear exactly how adversely affected they will be. Um, just a, a snapshot of over the overall figures. So you have the Environmental Protection Agency is going to see uh, a change, uh, a drop, a net change in 31% in their budget. 
31% of their budget is going to be cut. Um, state and other development programs, 29%. Uh, uh, agriculture is going to lose 21%. Labor, 21%. Justice, 20%. Health and human services, 16%. Commerce, 16% decrease. Education, 14% decrease. Uh, transportation, 13% decrease. Despite his claims that he's going to do all of this for the infrastructure, he's going to gut transportation by 13%. Housing and urban development, 12% decrease. Uh, the Department of the Interior, uh, 12%. Uh, energy, 6%. Treasury, 4%. NASA, 1%. Uh, and the only people who are going to see increases is veteran affairs, 6%. Great. Uh, homeland security, an increase of 7%. And defense, an increase of 10%. I, I, veteran affairs, yes, right? Because we have, we have, a, we, it has been disgusting in all previous administrations the way we treat the soldiers that we send off to fight our wars, right? Uh, but an increase in spending on defense at this juncture, for what purposes? You know, we saw the budget that uh, Paul Ryan passed uh, that gave the military uh, more money than they even asked for. And now on top of that, they're going to see a net increase of 10 percent uh, in Donald Trump's budget. And more importantly than simply what they're spending it on, it who he's cutting it from. I, I mean, um, the National Institutes, uh, Institute of Health. He's cutting funding for them. Um, the Center for Public Broadcasting, which is um, one of the, 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 the organization that helps create NPR and your local PBS, he's cutting funding there. Now, granted, this is um, not the budget that's going to come out of the House in the Senate. It's not. Um, but again, it is a clear statement of Donald Trump's values such that he has any values. It, it is a mentality of, uh, I mean, look at it. If you, if you look at everything here, right? If you look at what he's increasing, uh, veteran affairs, homeland security, and defense, it gets back to this nativist mentality um, that has been at the root of American society from the beginning. Um, one of the slogans during the revolutionary war was, uh, Taxes for defense, but not one cent more. In other words, they were willing to spend money on 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 the military, on on the revel. You know, th they were willing to spend money on conflict, but not one cent more. And this is a sentiment that exists in American society since its inception. It's here today, and you have people like um, not that he's important, but I want to point him out, uh, Glenn Beck, who who looks at this. And as a Christian man, he is so proud of Trump for gutting Mills on wheels in order to spend more money on the military. That's a hell of a Christian position, Glenn Beck. And the only reason I bring Glenn Beck up is because of the fondness that the quote unquote resistance found and had uh, with Glenn Beck. You know, what do you think about him now? Uh, uh, resistance? What do you think about him? Now that he's celebrating, he's super proud of Trump because he's created this draconian budget that emphasizes war and has no commitment to social development, no commitment to development of human capital, of hu just anything investing in the people. Let's put our money in our money in weapons and warfare. And Homeland Security, you know, the surveillance state. So the, this is a this is. I, to be honest with you, um, my first glance at this budget suggests that this is not even a Donald Trump budget. This is your standard token Republican budget. This, these are the values that they express on an ongoing basis. This is what they consider to be a moral budget. I had to do this to keep me from cussing. I'm sorry, radio audience, you can't see my air quotes. But this to them represents a moral statement, right? Uh, just like just like uh, Paul Ryan said of the Obamacare repeal um, uh, 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 piece of legislation that it was a a a, a it's a bill of mercy when in fact it was a bill according to um, the young Kennedy I forgot his first name the congressman who was part of the the Robert Kennedy family um, he said it is a bill of malice right so their their entire value system is completely 
opposite of anything remotely moral, even if your morals are not based on a religious a religion, it's it's completely bereft of any investment in humanity. But all our cards are on the table for spending money to kill people and then to take care of our soldiers after that. The only thing redeeming in this entire budget is the fact that he wants to spend more on our veterans, but he wants to create more veterans. <laughs> He wants to create more veterans by increasing funding to the military so that we can have a justif a reason to go to war and then create more veterans. At least he's not, you know, at least he's not going to send them off to war and then gut the, the VA afterwards. But again, this is a moral statement. Uh, doc, uh, budgets are always a statement of your values. And, and Donald Trump doesn't value health and human services. He doesn't value the National Institute of Health. He doesn't value meals on damn wheels. Like the most basic human. Uh, it's like who sits down to just, just I want to demonstrate this for you. How are you, who sits down? and thinks about, man, we really got to spend more money on weapons. How are we going to do this? Raise taxes? No, 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 no. Don't raise taxes. What the hell is wrong with you? Let's take money. Let's take food out of the mouths of the most needy people in America. That's how we're going to pay for this shit. Like, this is literally, this is, this is what you do in this type, type of budget. We're, we're, we're not going to increase taxes to spend on this military increase but we're going to take food out of the mouths of the neediest people in America in order to spend more money on war. Asinine doesn't even begin to describe the type of character or the, the void of character that these, these politicians, they're, 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 they're not human. Anyway, caller, you're live on the air. What is your name, comment, and or question? Hey, Ben, this is Brianna. Hey, Brianna, what's on your mind? Oh, not so much. I, when I read that budget, I was like, Jesus Christ, he doesn't give a shit about anybody. Anybody. <laughs> anybody. <laughs> anyway, go yeah, yeah. He's basically about to screw over all his voters and everybody else. Yeah. And it says a lot about his character, and he just, he's all for himself, fan. I guess my main question is, for those Trump supporters who are, you know, your neo-Nazis, white nationalists, and all that, I mean, like, is it worth having your children's lives, your lives, everything that you need to destroy so you can watch other people suffering? Like, is mm -hmm. it really worth all that? Because by... While he said... While he's saying Muslims, he's ready to gut your public education. While he's... While ISIS is deporting just massively, like, they're just cracking down on people. They're, he's ready to send your kids to war. It ain't going to be his kids that are going to go, what, whatever country he's going to war to, it's going to be your kids yep. that are going to be going to war. Yep. Like, and and from what we can tell with all these budget cuts, and wasn't there something like George Bush Jr. Senator did back then? Like, was it similar? Or I don't know, I can't remember. Long time ago. Because when these kind of proposals get put into place, we usually have a, a major crash coming down the line. Mm. I'm not saying that if Hillary was in office, she wasn't going to have a crash. I know a crash is coming, but he's speeding up the process. Yeah, no, for sure. So for not sure. only that, well, for sure. And and, and to be so sure, not, to be sure, like I, I and I hear I hear what you're saying, and I, I agree with a lot of what you said. But I feel like I, I don't want you to even. Um, feel like you have to do the but Hillary thing here, right? Because one thing we could say for certain, for damn certain, Hillary was not going to present a budget like this. And granted, Hillary's budget would not would be it would be dead on arrival in the House anyway. But in terms of a statement of what's important to her, she's not going to gut Mills on wheels to increase spending on the military. I mean, she just wasn't going to do that. And this is this is where we are with with Donald Trump. But uh, go ahead and get the last word in on, on that. Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't saying he was, she was going to get it. I was just trying to say that mm -hmm. she wasn't going to stop whatever crash she was going to do. Mm -hmm. Like I yeah. knew Hillary, even though she was the most established person on the planet, I know she wouldn't do that because she's going to have a bunch of angry voters. Yeah, her. for sure. She'd be smart enough not Absolutely. not to do it. Trump is not that. Not Trump's not that bright. 
and nor his or his supporters, right? Brianna, you make an excellent point yeah. there, right? So even if this was something, let's let's take the Hillary. Let's take Hillary for a second. If this was something that Hillary desperately wanted to do, ha, 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 let's, let's spend more money on the military. Let's kill a bunch of people. She would at least be constrained by the portion of her voters who at their core is like, you're not going to cut damn mill on wheels, right? The, the basics. You're not going to cut uh, public broadcasting. You're, you're not going to go there. And so she was politically constrained she would have been politically constrained to some degree um whereas the flip side of it is donald trump's base the people who are going to be hurt the most by this they're cheering this shit on and that's the most fascinating thing about this whole conversation uh brianna it's always a pleasure thanks so much for your call uh to that end she actually thanks for bringing that up because she reminds me of this clip of uh donald trump the, the clip of Donald Trump and Tucker Carlson, where he explains that Tucker Carlson is explaining what you're getting ready to do with this. Uh, uh, I believe here in this context, they're not talking about the budget so much as the American Health Care Act. Um, what, they, what they're getting ready to do is going to hurt his voters. And this is how Donald Trump responded to it. I, I, you actually have to listen very closely because he says it very quickly. Uh, but it's almost unbelievable. Listen to this exchange. This bill has as one of its centerpieces a tax cut for investors that would primarily benefit people making over $250,000 a year. Already done pretty well in the past 10 years, as you know. Yeah. A Bloomberg analysis showed that counties that voted for you, middle class and working class counties, would do far less well under this bill yeah. than the counties that oh, voted for that. Hillary, the more affluent counties. Yeah, I know that. It, seems like maybe this isn't account. consistent with the message of the last election. No, a lot of things aren't consistent. But these <laughs> a lot of are going aren't to be negotiated. We've got to go to the Senate. We're going to see yep. what happens in the Senate. Now, right now, we have five or six. Okay, that's, that's it. I mean, okay, so he said two things there. Tucker Carlson says, according to a report and analysis by Bloomberg, this is going to hurt the counties that voted for you the most, Donald Trump. And he says, oh, I know that. Now, mind you, I don't think he knows that. I think he's just saying that so he doesn't look as though the reporter he's interviewing with actually knows more than him. But he went ahead and said, oh, I know that, which means that it's not significant enough to him upon hearing this. Even if he's hearing this for the first time, the fact that what his bill is going to do is going to hurt his voters doesn't resonate enough with him to actually give him pause. But rather, he runs right through it and says, oh, I know that. Then the second thing he says is that. Um, there are a lot of inconsistencies. Tucker Carlson says, isn't that inconsistent with the promises of the campaign? Oh, there's a lot of inconsistencies. Really? But here's the thing. The people, he, Donald Trump has this leverage because the people that support him, they, they love this. They eat this stuff up. They, they're eating this up. Because there's a great divide. Like a lot of people made it seem like it was only poor people voting for Donald Trump. No, it's far from the truth. You have a lot of entitled rich people who voted for Donald Trump. And for them, they're not going to be bothered by many of the changes at all. I mean, if you make over six figures a year, uh, you know, $150,000 to $200,000 a year, not much Donald Trump is going to do, say, you know, short of crashing the entire economy. It's really going to affect you. In fact, it might help you because you're going to get a tax cut. Take a pause. Anyway, you're going to get a tax cut. They're going to make, you know, they're going to be better off. But those poorest communities who actually depend on these programs that he's now cutting, who depend on Obamacare, such as it is, right? You know, it could have been even better if their if their governors had expanded, expanded Medicaid. But I digress. It's a whole different conversation. The people who need it the most are people who voted for him. And here Donald Trump is doing what a classic Republican does. They do for the wealthiest and not only don't give a ladder up for the poorest, but they take actions that directly harm the most marginalized and the poorest. We may complain about the Democratic Party's uh, willing willingness to never do anything to change the structure. Right. But. Here, Donald Trump and his Republican Party are doing the quintessential Republican thing, which is we're going to give tax breaks to the wealthiest and we're going to make the poorest pay for it. And what does he say to it? He says, oh, I know. I mean, how many ways can we say congratulations? You guys played yourselves tremendously here. Call it your live on the air. Uh, what is your name, comment and or question? 
Hey, man, it's hey, Bryce. Hey, Bryce, um, what's happening, man? So, I'm not shocked at all about this, him, you know, trying to gut stuff. And, you know, the Republican Party, ever since the party's, you know, switched, they've just been lost in the sauce of, you know, right-wing fundamentalists and, and all the, you know, the racists and people like that. And they don't give a damn about if it affects their kids as long as all the minorities suffer, you know, in a sense. And, you know, they probably feel like it won't have affect them too bad until everything crashes. Yeah. And I don't know if the budget is going to get passed or something's going to get passed because there are corporate and moderate Republicans that might sit there and say, well, I don't know about all this. So it's the possibility that some stuff might not get, you know, ripped apart, but the yeah. majority of it probably will. It's kind of a 50-50 thing because apparently I heard that um, when I was watching TYT, they were saying how a lot of the president's budgets don't really get passed a lot. Like their proposals don't get passed. It's more of a Congress thing. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's just, it's just, I'm not shocked. It's just, this is where we are. And one last quick point that I talked to Brandon about a couple, like a month ago, was that when the parties switch, Republicans and Democrats, if the Democrat Party had ran on the principles that we always talk about and beat the drum on, then we wouldn't not only be in this position, but but then it would be in a position where Republicans probably went out of one election and for a long, long time because you know before the before they you know went all that field, you know they're supposed to be the party that wasn't supposed to do that, and you know they obviously have not, and here we are today. Yep. But yeah, I mean, this is a while. Yep. Thanks for the call, man. I appreciate it. 857-600-0518. And that is a part of the calculus right there. You you clearly, um, this presents... (laughs) <laughs> this presents a phenomenal opportunity. Uh, it, it's twofold, right? With the Affordable Care Act, um, the Democrats. So the Democrats could use this as an opportunity to go after single payer or at a minimum go after the public option. They're not. A lot of people are like, oh, this proves that the Democrats are evil. Maybe. Maybe. But you know what it also proves? It also proves that the crap that Donald Trump and Paul Ryan, that they're trying to pull, is so ridiculous that really the Democrats don't have to budge. And they can look back at the Affordable Care Act, which which had its problems, which did not address the underlying issue with health care. Let's be clear. But because of the, 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 the crap that Donald Trump and Paul Ryan are presented, neither of which want to take of whom want to take credit for it. They don't want to call Ryan care. They don't want to call Ryan care. They don't want to call it Trump care. Uh, but because it is so ridiculous that it actually makes the Affordable Care Act look good. So I'm really of the opinion that the Democrats actually don't have to politically chip positions because of what Donald Trump and them are presenting. What, what he's presenting is so ridiculous. It makes affordable, the Affordable Air Care Act look like something everyone should long for. I mean, the proof is in the pudding. Look at the look at the approval ratings of, of, the, of Obamacare now. Right. People love Obamacare. You know why they love Obamacare? Not because it's an actual solution to the underlying problems. They love Obamacare because what Donald Trump and Paul Ryan are trying to push on Americans is so ridiculous that it makes Obamacare look great. But the underlying argument is still the same. I mean, they are so ridiculous that if the Democrats actually did believe in single payer, uh, this would be the opportune time to run on it. Uh, but clearly they don't believe in it, so they're not going to run on it. Um, but that's a whole different conversation. Thanks for the call. Um, let's shift gears a little bit. I want to talk about um, I want to talk about hyperbole <laughs> and how we are now living in a time where we no longer have to speak hyperbolically about issues. Um, we quite literally can very spe- specifically say that we're dealing with Nazis, at least one in particular. Uh, the guy on your screen, Sebastian Gorka, uh, it has come out today that he is actually aligned uh, and a member with an organization that um, actually has Nazi roots. Uh, and this is according to forward.com. Um, there's a Nazi al- allied group that claims that Donald Trump's 
top aide, Sebastian Gorka, uh, is a sworn member. Um, so if you've seen Fox News or seen any of the major outlets, Donald Trump has rolled out Sebastian Gorka to be one of his, his he is Donald Trump's top counterism terror counterterrorism advisor. Um, he's allegedly a formal member of a Hungarian far right group that is listed by the United States uh, Department, uh, State Department, as um, having been, quote, under the direction of the Nazi government of Germany during World War II. Leaders of the organization have um, um, have clearly identified that this is who they are. This is this is their roots. Uh, so much so that this organization um has been identified by the state department um, as being allied with the Nazis. Um, So the, the organization or the order is known as uh, Vitezi Rind. And I'm sure I massacred that name. Uh, It was established as a loyalist loyalist group um, by Admiral Miklos Horthy, who ruled Hungary as a staunch nationalist from 1920 to 1944. Um, It was a staunchly anti-Semitic regime, um, and it imposed, quote, it imposed restrictions on Jews prior to World War II and cooperated with the Nazi regime, taking marching orders directly from Hitler, close quote. (laughs) I mean... We're, we're not even talking in hyperbole anymore. We're dealing with people whose worldviews are so extreme that they are literally a part of organizations with r- Nazi ties and roots. Um, so, I mean, what do you what do you what do you say about this? Right. Um, we, we've been talking about it in the sense of. We've been we, we've been mentioning it in the sense of Nazi overtones, uh, Nazi sympathizers. Um, um, he you know, we, we talk about it in loose language, almost as hyperbole. Um, but I mean, we're, we're we're really talking about a guy who's a part of this order that has like this is who he is. Um his membership in the organization could have impacted his immigration status. Uh, but he has since he's, he's nationalized as a citizen here in the United States. Um, uh, the group that he allegedly belongs to, uh, is, is a reconstitution quote, a reconstitution of the original group on the state department list. Uh, Gorka, according to fellow members belong to, uh, this organization and it upholds all the national and oft times racial principles of of the original group as established by Horthy. And again, Horthy was the, um, was the founder uh, who was a staunch nationalist and staunchly anti-Semitic. And so the group, to be clear, for pe- before people say, oh, they had their roots in, um, in this far-right extremism, um, anti-Semitism, the group has identified that they are still there, right? They're they are there and they hold to those values, the same values today as they had originally. Um, There you go. We're dealing with legitimate Nazis in the in the White House or at least in the president's circle. I want to read one more quote on this so you can understand um, the group's mission. Um, So uh, this is a a, a quote directly from the website forward.com who who broke this news. They said, quote, one of the original aims of the organization was to ensure such uh, might to the Hungarian race, which with tremendous power strikes every subversive state and anti-national movement. So it's not just a passive um, longing for um, for these nationalistic ideas it is a forceful organization it's an organization that wants to have and obtain enough might right literally that's in quote ensure such might to the hungarian race with which tremendous power strikes every subversive state and anti-national movement i need to be redundant because as we're not dealing with hyperbole, we're dealing with a group who presently 
holds on to the original values um, as set forth by Admiral Miklos Horthy, um, who started the organization and and um, led it from 1920 to 1944 um, and started it and based it on nationalistic anti-Semitic principles allied with Nazis taking direct orders from Adolf Hitler. Right. And this group currently holds to those principles and it is not some passive I don't even know how you can consider this type of Nazism to be passive. But before anyone makes that argument, it's not passive. It is aggressive. It is outward reaching, attempting to obtain enough power to push back against any subversive state and, quote, anti-national movement. This is the guy who is Donald Trump's lead counterterrorism advisor who speaks on behalf of the president of the United States day in and day out. Let's take this caller. Caller, you're live on the air. What is your name, comment, and or question? Hello, my name is Todd. Yep. What's on your mind? My name is... Um, I really... Uh, I mean, the fact that he has a... Um, uh, this guy uh, who... What's his name? Uh, Gorky or something? Gorka, yeah. Uh, he, the fact that he's doing this... Is that really that surprising? No, I mean the fact is that most uh, we should have a lot of us should have seen this coming. I mean he has put this whole entire cabinet in gaggle of right wing nuts who have basically sabot well, basically um I'm sorry I'm trying no, to get man, the word say, out say it. I hear I hear um, your passion go for it. Um, he basically has this gaggle of right wing nuts around him. Like Bannon, uh, mm-hmm. like Bannon, um, yeah, Mr. Bose, yeah, and I mean this. I think I, I, I think. Honestly, let me let me I, jump in there. Let me let me jump in there and say something, and then I'll let you speak again. Um, is it surprising? No, but is it oftentimes excused as um, some type of? passive hyperbole like it's it's hyperbole on our part and if they are you know if they are white nationalists it's not like it's they're not like a part of the clan right it's not like they're they're actually actively trying you know this these are the excuses that um a lot of people in the trump administration directly have said and a lot of trump supporters have said and now we're getting to the point where it's crystal clear. It is not hyperbole. We're not uh, we're not just being uh, overly dramatic when we say we're dealing with Nazis, when now the record shows that we're dealing with a guy who is tied to an organization that took their orders from Hitler and they still hold to those principles today. So does that mean that, uh, you know, is it shocking? No, but it should be an eye opener for anyone who felt as though we were just being overly dramatic. Right. I think it's time for us to get past this stage where we second guess ourselves or we try to uh, uh, try to be so logically sound or try to be morally superior and not deal in hyperbole. Well, congratulations. Here we are. We're at this point now. This is this is not hyperbole. So I agree with you. You know, we shouldn't be surprised, but we should act on it and, 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 and do something as as much as we can do about it. But I'll let you get the last word. I mean, the fact is that I honestly don't see us being able to do anything about it. I am mm. probably more pessimistic than other people on this subject. Yep. I I hear you. Well, I hear you, but I can't let you stay there on it. Uh, I do appreciate the call, and I'm not going to hang up on you yet. I want to finish this. Uh, don't don't give up. I mean, there there are enough people who are at least still troubled by Nazism to not be okay with this, right? There are enough people that we can convince to come to our side of the equation. Uh, even if we don't convince Republicans, there are enough people who didn't vote that we can actively go out and do something about it. Can we stop them? Can we impeach Trump or get him out of office between before 2020? More than likely not, but waiting to impeach him is not the right move. We need to actively organize to fight back against him now. And also in the 2017 special elections, 2018 midterm elections, and most certainly by 2020, we need to organize. So, so I, I feel your I feel your angst, uh, but but don't throw in the towel. There's there are things that we can actually do, man. Thanks thanks for the call. We got to take this next caller. Um, 
great great call and great comments uh the lines are still open 857-600-0518 and we are dealing we're dealing with i mean every iteration of hatred that you can imagine donald trump is proudly surrounding himself with it i mean but again <clears throat> we 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 knew that uh, but i don't know if everyone knew the extent to which we are dealing with that um a couple of other stories here <clears throat> excuse me so donald trump um about two weeks ago accused president obama of tapping his wires and you know perhaps he was not aware of the reality that whatever he says um is something that can command an investigation immediately um investigations ensued and yesterday um the house intelligence committee said that there was no evidence of trump's claim and today the senate intelligence committee um said that there was no evidence of the claim what's fascinating about this is if there was evidence donald trump was the person who had the ability to declassify it and expose it because it fell underneath the purview of the Department of Justice. And to that end, Jeff Sessions, making sure to cover his behind, uh, said that he gave no indication to Donald Trump that something like this actually happened. It's very fascinating to see how quickly um, how quickly Jeff Sessions uh, moved into protecting his butt, um, even though Donald Trump had to look out for him uh, on his perjury. But anyway, that's not the story. The story here is that Donald Trump opened his mouth based on a headline and a story from Mark Levin, uh, who writes for Breitbart, who is a right wing conservative shill hack, who himself was smart enough to pose it as a rhetorical question and not assert it as a statement of fact. Donald Trump not being intelligent enough to float it as a question, but instead asserted it as a fact. Um, stirred the entire country and the in investigative capacity of the House and the Senate into action, and they found nothing, which essentially means that Donald Trump, um, for whatever reason, which I'm sure this is not the first and definitely not going to be the last time, lied to America straight out, word for word, just a flat out lie, accusing President Obama of, quote, quote tapping his wires. Um, the president um, last week, he tweeted again, even after the initial tweet. Um, uh, I, well, actually, no, this was two weeks ago. And it was the original tweet saying that this is McCarthyism. This is this is this is this is uh, surveillance. Uh, you know, he, he really made a deal out of it so big that it set everyone in motion. Um, John McCain, you know, demanding evidence. Uh, uh, Lindsey Graham, the, you know, Republic, his own party demanding that he turn he turn over some evidence that the FBI produce some evidence and nothing um, nothing could, was found. Uh, Rep Representative Devin Nunes, a Republican from California, um, who's the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, he, uh, he said in a press conference, he said, quote, I don't believe just in the last week of time, the people we've talked to, I don't believe there was an actual tap of Trump Tower. At this point, we do not have any evidence. I mean, we knew this. I, I think I think rational people understood that there was a either no tap at all or B, if there was a tap, that there's a, a tap that was obtained through a FISA warrant that really has its own life outside of the purview of the president. Um, in the in terms of the Senate, um, uh, Intelligence Committee, they found no indication that Trump Tower was the subject of surveillance. Uh, the chairman of the committee, Richard Burr, also a Republican of North Carolina, he said, quote, based on the information available to us, we see no indications that Trump Tower was a subject of surveillance by any element of the United States government, government, either before or after Election Day 2016. I mean. Paul Ryan, Speaker of the House, he got in on it. He said, quote, um, we've cleared that up. <laughs> we've seen no evidence of that. This is this is this is hilarious if it wasn't um, an indication of the child that we have sitting in the White House. Um, it is fascinating to me how <laughs> mediocre does not even begin to describe Donald Trump. Feckless is not substantive. It's not. It, it, it doesn't capture it. 
It doesn't capture who Donald Trump is. We have literally, you know, not literally, but we in many ways have elected your angry uncle who sits around and argues at Fox News all day and they share those viral emails, those chain emails talking about Obama stealing their weapons and taking their Second Amendment rights. And, you know, they see a headline from Infowars and they swear it's tr- this is who we have elected as the president of the United States. And because he is that person and he that is his character, what do we expect? What do we expect other than him doing exactly what he has always done? I don't know where I heard this, probably on Twitter. I don't know who to credit it with, but it's not mine. He said, um, the, the person who tweeted it said, he ran on chaos. Um, he was elected in chaos. And should we expect anything else but for him to govern through chaos? I think that's the most accurate description of who Donald Trump is. All right, let's get through a, a, a couple of other um, Jesus, it it gets worse. Michael Flynn, Michael Flynn, I have to cover the story because I'm sitting back and I'm thinking how lucky Donald Trump was that Michael Flynn lied and lied so sloppily that he got caught and subsequently had to resign because had Michael Flynn not resigned and it came out later as it did today that Michael Flynn worked for Russian companies, multiple Russian companies as for, as a speaker, as a consultant in different capacities. And it came out that he was uh, working on behalf of the Turkish government. We discovered that last week. And he did all of this without being registered with the U S government as a foreign agent. Had that come out later on, that might have been enough to actually scuttle the Trump administration. So what am I talking about? Um, So Michael Flynn, um, he was paid $11,250 by a Russian air cargo company. Um, He was paid another $11,250 by a Russian cybersecurity company. Um, The air cargo company was suspended as a vendor by the United States. (laughs) I mean, the cybersecurity company was trying to get more contracts with the U.S. government. And so in many ways, he was lobbying on behalf of these companies or he was in the position to be a lobbyist for these companies. Um, He was paid thirty three thousand dollars to be a speaker by Russia Today, RT, the television network that's funded by fun with Russian funds. Right. I mean, I've got friends over at RT, but they know just like I know that they get their funding from the Russian government. Um, Flynn was paid thirty three thousand dollars, thirty three thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars to be a speaker. Um, And he did all of this without disclosing it, apparently, to the transition team, because I just can't fathom that they would assign this guy who has allegiances and loyalties to the Turkish government and the Russian government, or at least Russian companies, the Turkish government specifically and Russian companies, he has loyalties to them assigning him to be the national security advisor. So a spokesperson, a spokesperson for Michael Flynn said, try to, here's their statement. They said, quote, General Flynn, like other government folks, signed on to a speaker's bureau. And what you're seeing is a result of that, giving speeches that he was paid and he was paid to do it. Uh, okay, that's, that's fine. Disclose it. I mean, let's, can we, can we agree that the, per, the top spy in the U.S., the top security official in the United States should not be a person who is beholden to another government? And in this case, I'm speaking specifically of Turkey, ally or not. I mean, he he's, was a lobbyist on behalf of the government of Turkey, and he was being paid by some Russian companies. I, I, is, it, is it illegal? No, not at all. But should that person be in charge of the NSA? Absolutely not. I mean, this, this shows you, I don't know, either how dismissive they are of the importance of these jobs, right? The significance of these jobs. They're either, and when I, when I say they, I'm talking about the Trump team. Either they knew this and they were like, eh, no big deal. 
or they did not do the vetting that's necessary to weed out someone like General, former General Michael Flynn. Um, that's 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 what we that's that's what we're dealing with. All right, let's talk about some other news. Um, some other news is actually um, pretty positive news. Uh, Bernie Sanders. Bernie, Bernie damn Sanders is very popular. Yes. Before I even talk about the story, I'm going to applaud <laughs> uh, Bernie Sanders. Uh, there's some polling that came out today um, uh, from the Washington Post uh, that said that Bernie Sanders just might be the most popular politician in America. <laughs> so there's a question on a poll that went out and the question was posed like this. Please tell me um, whether you have a generally favorable or unfavorable opinion of uh, Bernie Sanders. Uh, in that poll, Bernie Sanders had um, high favorables among minorities, uh, women, uh, African-Americans, um, even higher ratings in those groups than he did with white men. So, you know, this narrative that Bernie Sanders has his race problem or he's misogynistic or he's sexist, you know, it really doesn't bear out in the polling in terms of how Americans perceive him. Uh, recent polling uh, shows from uh, Fox News and NBC and CNN shows that Sanders might actually be more popular uh, than anyone else. He's clearly more popular than Donald Trump. Um, he was more popular than Donald Trump, not only after the election, but before the election. But we won't even we, we, we you know, I'm not going to relitigate the fact that Bernie would have won. Anyway, I, I didn't say it. I'm just just saying. Um, so according to a Fox News poll, news poll, it showed that Sanders um, had a 60 percent favorable rating and was that was nearly twice as high as a 34 percent of his 34 percent unfavorable rating. I mean, he's a popular dude. And this is a Fox News. poll. This, uh, this might be their scientific poll, which. Yeah. Anyway, whole different conversation. But the Fox News poll, this is a socialist. This is um, um, I, what's the name of the guy off of Fox News? He, he was he was talking about these. Uh, I can't think of his due name. The, um, the dude with the British accent. Anyway, he's the, the pompous dude. Anyway, he he's he's saying that he can't believe that Bernie Sanders is this popular and he's a socialist. He was like, you know, socialism doesn't really bother the young people in America anymore. You know, yeah, we're well, here, here. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Um, and he and he he lamented. He was like, because socialism is like poison to me. But Bernie Sanders is popular and he's a socialist. Um, NBC, uh, uh, NBC News, uh, their poll with Wall Street Journal. Um, it was taken around the same time. It said that 51 uh, percent of Americans like Bernie Sanders and only 29 percent disliked him. CNN had similar numbers, 59% approval, 35% disapprove. Uh, YouGov, the online poll, has Sanders more popular than um, former President Obama's wife, Michelle Obama. I mean, that's, that's a feat. Like, there's very few people that are more popular than Michelle Obama, and Bernie Sanders managed to be more popular than Michelle Obama. I mean, it... it there, there are probably a lot of things at play here. Um, you know, the election is over and people are sobering up to who Donald Trump was. Um, they are still holding the line on. They hated Hillary. Um, so there's nobody else on this main stage. Right. Um, nobody else is on the on the international stage, on the national stage, um, talking about the issues, talking to Americans. I mean, you would think that Bernie Sanders is still in the campaign. Uh, in campaign mode, doing these town halls, being featured on CNN, being featured on MSNBC, talking about the issues that are important to every American, even if those issues are oftentimes um, whitewashed as being only important to white working class people. Um, the reality of it is it's very important to most Americans uh, because most Americans are working class or poor. Right. Uh, that I mean, that's that's just where America is, you know, uh, middle class, lower middle class or working class. That's that's where most Americans exist on a day to day basis. So it only makes sense that even if he's a socialist and everybody's afraid of a socialist, it makes sense that the person who's talking about the issues that is most important, that are most important to Americans would be the most popular politician in America. It's just a damn shame. People couldn't figure that out. Anyway, 
<laughs> you know the story. All right, folks. Um, I think I have some other stories in here. I, I don't know. But the phone lines are open for about few, a few more seconds. Um, I don't know if I want to talk about that. I do want to talk about this. <laughs> It's a great story. Shout out to David uh, who put this in. Uh, <laughs> I, I should I should probably pull up an image. Anyway, um, there was a batch of weed donated to Goodwill, <laughs> according to WGN TV uh, in Monroe, Washington. Someone donated um, a lot more than they intended to a Goodwill in Washington State last week. Uh, Goodwill employees at Monroe got a surprise when they opened a, a, a donated cooler and found marijuana. Um you know, um, the police were called in to investigate, blah, blah, blah. But here's a quote. And I, I thought we should read the quote. Uh, the employees were surprised when they opened the lid. Um, the Monroe Police Department said that the container contained 3.7 pounds of weed <laughs> with a street value of twenty four thousand um, dollars. I'm sorry. That's not getting turned into <laughs> anybody. Isn't it legal in Washington state? It's very legal. Why call the police? Why call the police in Washington state? I mean, I imagine you don't make any money at Goodwill because I mean, I, I know personally you don't make any money at Goodwill. Uh, so why turn that in? It's legal. 3.7 pounds. Take 0.75, pound, five, uh, you know, 0.75 pounds for yourself. Smoke that. Have a good time. Sell the rest and make more in a anyway. I'm not I'm not always the best person for advice. You guys have a good night. The Benjamin Dixon Show is only possible with listener support. Go to www.thebenjamindixonshow.com to register for our blog. Join the Progressive Army and support the Benjamin Dixon Show. It's ben Dixon. If you like this episode, be sure to share, like, and subscribe. Consider becoming a Patreon. Go to www.patreon.com forward slash the BPD show and support the Benjamin Dixon show.